cinemas, in warehouses, in converted cinemas, in lonely and isolated and dangerous places. Into your presence people have come, alone or or gathered together with others. Your church is wherever your people meet together in worship, in fellowship and in prayer. And Lord, your presence is discernible wherever your spirit is allowed to enter. And we've entered into your presence this morning, God, in song. We want to remain here with you for the next hour. Would you be close to us? Into your presence we've come, Father God, mindful of our own failings, our thoughts, our words and actions that have shown nothing of your love this week. We remember what Jesus did. How he died on a cross that our sins may be forgiven. And so we confess our sin before you. We confess before you what we have done to offend you and to harm our neighbors and ourselves. We confess, Lord, that we so often want more. When in you we have everything we need. Would you save us from our own temptations so that we may follow you more freely? We've confessed, Lord, that we are just sinners. But we are so deeply loved by our Heavenly Father. We remember the sacrifice of your Son on a cruel cross so that we might know freedom from the guilt of sin and be made right again with our Creator God. And so we thank you for these moments, these holy moments of silence, when we can confess, Lord, and receive your unending forgiveness. Lord, we've begun our journey with you this Lent. On Wednesday, we were reminded again that we are, it's from ash that we have come, and to ash we will return. That this Lent we are to give to you our time, our devotion, our spirituality. Give us open hearts and open minds during this season. Hearts and minds that are open to your guiding word. Hearts and minds that are open to the leading of your gentle Holy Spirit. And help us to truly hear and to, and to see and to do what you ask of us, Lord. God, on this first Sunday in Lent, we remember the road to the cross that your son Jesus traveled. And he did it for our sake. It's a road that we cannot travel by ourselves. God, you know our hearts. You've knitted our inmost being together in the wombs of our mothers. You know our deepest desires, fears, worries and dreams. Help us to journey during these 40 Lenten days into a new awareness of your presence in our lives. Draw us close to you. Make us mindful again of the sacrifice on that cross and the wonderful gift of forgiveness and the promise of salvation and eternal life. We've come into your presence, God. We've come expectant. Speak to us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning I've asked my colleague and very dear friend, Amon, to share in the pulpit um, with me this morning. But before I hand over to Amon, the kids are going to go to Sunday school and I'm going to invite those that are reading to please come forward.
The first reading is from Romans 12, verses 3 to 8. It's found on page 189 of the Pew Bible. But first, let's pray. Lord, bless these readings and let us hear and understand all that you want us to. Bless Amon as he also gives us your word. Help us to use it as you would like. In Jesus' name, Amen. Romans 12, verse 3. For by by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Our second reading will be found on page 206 of the New Testament, reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 31. Unity and diversity in the body. Just as the body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink, and so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church First of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. And all pos- are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongue, tongues, do all interpret now eagerly desire the greater gifts and yet I will show you the most excellent way good morning 
Can you hear me at the back there? All right. My, my voice is a little bit hoarse. I've been traveling in East London and PE, and uh, some, of the, some, some of the places really were not favorable you know, to, my, to my voice. So, as a result, I suffer the consequence. Why don't we walk around and greet somebody? I want you to greet at least two or three people, not less than that. Tell them they look younger than the last time you saw them. And I want, them, I want you to look, the, to look them in their eyes. All right. Can we stand? Do that for a moment. Okay. And I'll do that. Done. When you're done, you may be seated. Great. <clears throat> it's uh, really lovely once again to be, to be back to the congregation here. What I liked about this morning was the fact that, you know, you had the nicest weather in all this time that I've come here. I've been very disappointed, dressed like a, a hillcrest person, coming to Mshanga only to be greeted, greeted by these nasty, you know, sticky feeling, you know, type of weather. So this morning I was very comfortable. That's why I'm in Mandela shirts, all right? Keeping the Madiba spirit, you know, alive. Uh, Michelle, it's good to see you. Uh, we haven't seen each other, actually, since last year, right? We've been talking to each other on the phone and all that. Welcome back from, uh, from Liv. I hope these people were very nice to you when you came back. Because that's the promise they made me. They'll be very nice to you. Okay. Great, thank you for the invitation. Michelle is one of those who is very com- comfortable, you know, in herself. I mean, she, I, I admire her gifts. I admire who Michelle is. And I'm saying this, I think I've said it even when she's not here. Uh, she's one of the few who can tolerate, you know, individuals like some of us. Um, and the nonsense that I bring sometimes. So, there are some ministers who don't want even to see Eamon, you know, because he brings this kind of nonsense. Uh, but, but. Really, seriously speaking, I have a lot of respect for Michelle and the friendship that, you know, we have formed and, and also, you know, with this, uh, this congregation. Today we are talking about uh, something that I want to put behind or sort of like a backdrop of what Michelle has started with you uh, this uh, past week on Wednesday Lent. So you have started a journey of Lent where we are going towards... Uh, the cross and the journey with the Lord and what he went through and what he teaches us on this journey of Lent. But with that backdrop, I want to just look at one incident, which I'm not using the scripture, but I'm using it as a background, which Jesus did in all this journey. One day, he called his disciples and he took a towel and he took some water and he started washing their feet. And uh, that was quite um, a surprise to his disciples because as a master, it was, go- it was supposed to be vice versa. They were supposed to wash his feet, but he washed you know, their feet. And that you read in the book of John chapter 13. And I'm sure you come to that as you walk with Michelle uh, during this Lent time. But I want to pick that theme and, and, and bring it you know, to what Paul is talking about in the book of Romans, uh, or in the letter uh, to the Romans and also to the Corinthians. And it's, uh, it's really fascinating what, what Paul is talking about here. How he described the church as the body of Christ. And how he looks at the physical body and compares the, the workings that happen in the church. Like we are the church. We are the gathered you know, people, people of God. So that's what I'm going to look at. First and foremost, there's something that I, I want to start with. I think let's go to the first slide. Thank you. It's a question that I ask myself. Where is our true value as human beings? Where is our true value? And I know that you know, a number of people have searched for value in many places. They've searched for value in positions at work. They've searched for value uh, in uh, being a celebrity. They've searched for value in having a lot of wealth, a lot of money. 
People are looking for value or self-worth, you know, in many, many places. And unfortunately, you find that, you know, there is a lot of disappointment that comes, you know, from those kind of searches. For a period of time, it may seem as if, you know, they have it or they've got it. But after some time, they realize that, well, there is no value in what they were searching for. There's no value in what they're searching for. We hear of what has been happening, you know, uh, uh, late, la- late last year, one celebrity, Robin Williams, very, very high profile, very good comedian, making the whole world laugh, and his end was not very, very good. It was a very sad end. I, I asked myself a question. How does the man who makes the whole world laugh end his life? What is the problem? How did we not see it coming? What, what was really the trouble there? I talk about, you know, I, I, I hear about Houston, you know, the, the lady Houston, and uh, you know the end. Uh, but what a beautiful singer, what a wonderful performer. But the end is not nice. I just, you know, heard last, uh, last week you know, on, the, on the radio, uh, uh, people who, who follow uh, Beyonce, is it Beyonce? You know, there are quite a number of people who follow Beyonce because the way she looks and whatever. But uh, unfortunately, the media sneaked the photos of her new self. Uh, she was not prepared with all the things that they put outside. And the media just, you know, snapped that and took it, you know, to the, to the, to the, social, to the social media. And now people are saying, no, we don't want to see. No, no, but, but that's who she is. That's a, what you're seeing, that's a true Beyonce. So the question is, where is the true world of our lives? Where is our true value? And this is where we need to pause as Christians and realize that our real value is not in the things outside. Our real value is not in the things that we see, the things that we touch. Our real value is or has been put in us. And first and foremost for me, the real value of a Christian, the real value of you, humanity is, number one, knowing who God is. The knowledge of who God is matters a lot. In the, in the book of Acts, you know, Paul writes that in Him we have our being. In Him we live and walk. In Him we have the true definition of who we are and who, who we need to be as, as, as people. Take God out of the picture. Take the Creator out of the picture. We are lost. Take the Creator out of the picture. We have no true definition of what life is all about. So for me, the knowledge of God, as we come to know God, the more we know God, the more we walk with God, the more we realize that without that connection, actually, you know, we are lost. Without that connection, there is a void, you know, within, within our own life. Secondly, the knowledge of who we true are in Christ, when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and our personal Savior, that gives us a new definition of who we are. In other words, we attain a new identity. We're no longer the same. That's why, you know, those, whatever you've done in the past, you know, Paul writes again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he says, If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. That's a new definition. So whatever I've done, whatever I've done in the past, whether I've sinned against God or I've, I've put my, 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 you know, my, 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 my back behind God, you know, that God puts away. He looks at us through His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why, you know, Lent is so wonderful. Because, you know, that journey which the Lord is taking is a journey of giving us a true identity of who we are. Without Christ, there is no true identity. There is confusion and commotion. People may satisfy themselves for a period of time, but you know, soon or later they will realize that that is a false identity. The true identity, the true comfort, the true settlement, the true security is knowing who Christ is. When we come to that point, friends, nothing matters. Nothing else matters. When we come to that point, we are no longer confused. We know where we are. We know where we are going. In other words, we have the purpose in life, and we have a bigger purpose not to live for. So, that is very, very important to know. The knowledge of who we truly are in Christ is very, very important for our true identity, our self-worth, and the true value of who we are as human beings. This is where transformation takes place. When we are transformed, when we have been changed, that actually, you know, God puts a 
a, a VAT, is it VAT? A VAT, a spiritual VAT on us. It's a value added, not tax, but value added life. So I'll call it VAL, all right? Value added life. He puts that stamp on us, and nobody can take it away from us. Nobody can take it away from us. And he calls us his own. Well, are we not going to make mistakes on the journey? We're going to make mistakes. Are we not going to sin? We're going to sin. Are we not going to fail? We're going to fail. But that does not move that value that God has put on us. So it's a wonderful thing, friends, to be in, in the Lord because it frees us. It gives us the freedom to live on this earth with purpose, not to be searching for an identity which is not there. Our true identity is found in Christ. Then it's a thirdly, when we know who God is and we know who we are truly are in the Lord Jesus Christ, what happens that no, there is also the knowledge of the mission that we have on this planet Earth? I, I, I've, I've given you examples of celebrities. I mean, I have a lot of respect for wonderful. There are wonderful celebrities there. But, you know, sometimes you wonder, what do, what do these people live for? You wonder, you know, you see the stress, the stress of trying to match up the expectation of the world. That kind of stress. But you know what? What I like about being in the Lord, being in Jesus Christ, I have no stress to try to impress. I have no stress to try to match up the expectation. I have no stress of that. All what I'm living for, I'm living for a purpose that God has created me for. And I've discovered that purpose. That's why I love doing what I'm doing here. Being here for me is not, it's not, it's not something that I've been pushed to do. I love it. It's coming from my heart. And I hope you're seeing that joy in me. I love it. I can spend you know, the whole week here. I know some of you, you know, you go like a slap, you know, whatever. I can spend the whole week. I love it. Why? Because this is where I need to be. And I love being here. And I've discovered the purpose why God has created me. To impact the lives of people, to encourage people, to lift up, you know, the hearts of those that are drowning, you know, in their own hurts and in their own wounds. If I can, if I can add value to that, then I'm living for the purpose of why I was created for. So there's no need to impress. There's no need to, 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 to you know, to work, you know, according to the expectations. It's just doing what I love doing. It's just doing what I've discovered God has given me. So, what I'm saying here is that, you know, our true value is actually finding our purpose. Finding that purpose. Finding the true, the true thing that we need to do. Something that excites us in our lives. Finding that part that will create an impact on the people, you know, around you. On the society where you live in. Finding something that you live for in your life. The legacy that you want to leave behind. Somebody says, you know, when I was 20 years old, I, uh, I, I, I really, you know, was wonder, worried and, and uh, I, I was wondering, you know, and uh, I was really, really, you know, careful about how I dressed, you know, how I did. Because, you know, I, I felt, you know, people really were looking at me and, and they were really, you know, they, they cared how I looked like when I was 20 years when I reached 40, I realized, you know what, you know what, I can live my own life, you know. I didn't even care what people thought about me, and I just lived my own life. Then I reached the skisties and beyond. You know what I discovered? No one even worried about me or cared about me, and cared about how I looked like. What a waste of time to impress. What a waste of time to try to create a value where a value is not supposed to you know, to be created. So, what is the point that I'm saying here? True Christian life, true value in us, friends. Number one is found in identifying and knowing who God is in our lives. And also discovering who we are in Jesus Christ. But also discovering the purpose why we are here. We are not here by accident. We are here for a purpose. And each one of us must strive. Each one of us must discover that purpose. Because at the end of life, we don't want to look back and say, what a waste of life. At the end of life, we want to say, what a value we've added to society. What a value we've added to our families. At the end of life, we want to look and say, you know what? I did my part. I did my part. I have met people who time has just closed on them. And it is too late to go back. I remember one uncle of mine, you know, who was dying in hospital. I just flew into Lusaka. I don't know if I've told this story here. I flew into Lusaka, 
And then my auntie phones me, says, you know what, before you do anything, your uncle is, uh, is, uh, is, is in hospital, he's in intensive care. And I went there. He was a young uncle. I mean, he was just, uh, he just reached, you know, 50, 50 years. So he was one of those young uncles, brilliant businessman. You know, he did very well in business. I went into hospital, and uh, fortunately that day, it was a Wednesday, I still remember, he, he, he could talk. Because for two weeks, he was in a coma. So that particular day, he was talking. So I arrived at the right day. So we talked, he started, you know, talking. You know, in all my chat with my uncle, he never mentioned, and I had two hours with him, he never mentioned about business, he never mentioned about all the political, you know, connections that he had, he never mentioned. You know what he told me? In those two, two hours, he kept on saying, you know what, you know what, if I can reverse life, I want for you to spend time with my wife, I want to spend time with my children, I miss them. I mean, these two weeks I've been here, I just hate being here. I miss them, I want to be with them. And I said, no, Uncle, this is, this is good. This is good. We had a good chat from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock. I left the hospital, went 9 o'clock, just before, as I was preparing, you know, I got a call from my aunt. My aunt says, you know, you can't believe. Something has just got worse. I said, what is it? I, I, I said, no, it's too late. Your uncle has just passed on. I had my special two hours with my uncle. Special two hours. But what this man told me, it was like, I wish I could, the way I was hearing, I wish I could reverse the time. But time, friends, is never reversed. You can't reverse time. When that time comes, there is no power on earth that can reverse the time. The time that we have is now. The time to discover who we truly are is now. The time to make a living and make an impact on life is now. The time to impact those around us, the time to love, the time to reach out, is now. When we can still breathe, when we can smile, when we can still talk, it's now. We can't procrastinate on life. Because when that time comes, there is no power that is going to reverse it. And it's, apart from my uncle, there are many people who have come across that, that way. There are people who have gone with a smile and say, you know what, I have done what I could. I was there when I was needed. I reached out when they needed me to reach out. I smiled when they needed my smile. I, I filled the vacuum when I realized there was a vacuum there. I participated when I needed to participate. So, friends, that is where our true identity is. All right, let's move on. I like Romans chapter 12. I mean, Romans chapter 12 is a very beautiful scripture. It's a, it's a passage of scripture that is coming amidst, you know, theological discussions that Paul starts in Romans chapter 9. In chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, he's arguing on theological themes. He's talking about the calling. He's asking, is Israel going to be saved if they've put their back, you know, on the Messiah? He's talking about predestination. He's talking about election. So, all these big themes are found in these passages of Scripture. Then he comes to uh, Romans chapter 12. And in this, he begins by contrasting the old and the new. He talks about sacrifices. He says, no, we have to commit ourselves as a living sacrifice to the Lord. What is in, the, in his mind? In his mind was the booze. In his mind were all those things that, you know, the Israelites were committing, you know, through sacrifice to appease or to please God for the cleansing of their sins. And Paul says, no, 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 we no longer need to do that. Because Jesus Christ has done that for us during rent. He has done that for us once and for all. We don't need to start sacrificing bulls. We don't need to start, you know, slashing ourselves. Jesus has done that for us. All what we need is to commit ourselves as a living sacrifice. So God is no longer interested in the dead bulls, in the dead cows that were offered in the Old Testament. God is interested in the living being, the living life. This is what Paul is talking about. Commit yourself as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Because why? God wants to use us as living beings to impact you know, this, this world. So what Paul is doing here is outlining also the new identity that we have in Jesus Christ. He's saying we are connected to Christ. And because we are connected to Christ, no one can boast. No one can say, look, you know what, I don't need you, I don't need that. No one can think more of themselves than they ought to think. 
What he's saying here is, the mind changes when we come to Christ. The way we look at things, the way we look at others, the way we look at ourselves, the, lo- the way we look at, at the church. There is a transformation that takes place you know, in our minds. We, don't, we no longer become self-centered. We begin to reach out you know, to others. And now what is he using here? He's using an example of the body. And there is a reference not to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, just like the body, the hand cannot say to the mouth or to the eyes, I don't need you. That would be completely chaos. Each member belongs to the body. And each member has its own identity, but the identity is in the body. The true identity is in the body. And each member saves the body. And what he's also bringing here is bringing a challenge that we need to belong. We cannot stand outside. We need to be part of. I was talking to a friend of mine talking about cricket. You know why I don't like cricket watching? Sorry, for those with due respect, those who like cricket, I'll be on your nerves this morning. Because it sends me to lack a slap. <laughs> cricket, you know, the, just, you know, that kind of, you know, throwing of that. It just sends me. If you want me to have a very nice nap, switch on the TV and show me cricket. I'll go to sleep. So this afternoon, Michelle, I'm going to sleep. All right. Sorry, I apologize for those who like cricket. I like, I like rugby. I like soccer. Actually, you know, those of us who come from, I come from Zambia. I always say, you know, my mother knows before I was born, I was trained to play soccer. You know why I say that? Because my mother would tell me, would tell you that when I was seven months in the womb, I started kicking. I was looking for a soccer ball right there, all right. So why, why, you know, some of you mothers were expecting, you know, whatever. If your child is kicking, don't take them to cricket. Take them to soccer, all right? Because they want to enjoy soccer. I like soccer. I like, I like rugby. Why? Because we are involved. We are involved in the game. This is why, you know, when I'm watching, you know, I avoid watching, you know, physical, physical rugby. Why? Because I get really uptight. Because, you know, up there on the, on, the, on the bench, you know, on the, on the uh, what do you call them, in the stadium, for me, if somebody is running and they're running and they're, they're scoring, I have already scored a try. So if that guy misses the try, I get very uptight. Don't look at me like that. I think you know what I'm talking about. Some of you, you know, even on the TV, you want to really shake that ball. Why did you miss a try? Because I've scored a try. Why, why I'm saying it, it brings participation. You cannot help watching rugby or so can just stand there, you know, nice and say, mm-hmm, whatever. No, no, no. You become part of. Emotionally, you become part of. And this is exactly what Paul is talking about. When we are the body of Jesus Christ, when we call ourselves the church, we can't watch from the periphery. We can't watch others, you know, throwing that little whatever you call it. We become part of. Emotionally, we become part of, we become connected. This is what Paul is saying. Be connected to the body of Jesus Christ. Because that's where service comes from. I don't know how much you're connected to this body here. Called, you know, the Deben North Presbyterian Church. I may be speaking to some of you who are really on the periphery, just watching the game. I am saying today, if you really belong to Jesus Christ, you look for ways of belonging here. You look for ways of participating. You look for ways of finding out where do I fit. You may not be a preacher like myself or like Michelle, but there are so many things, activities happening within the body where you need to belong. Some of you are good administrators. Some of you, your smile will welcome so many people you know, to this church. Don't put me on the door because you know, my greeting may just put people off. They will never come next Sunday. So why put me on the door? There are people who naturally just, you know, are, are welcoming. They're loving, whatever. Let's, let's, let's discover where we can begin to be useful within the body of Jesus. Church must be exciting, friends. Not just rugby, not just soccer. Church must be exciting. Actually, if there's a place where it should be exciting, it's the church. We are not just here to watch Michelle doing the work. By the way, I haven't spoken to Michelle since last year. So don't look at Michelle. Why did you tell Emma? This is what I'm saying. Michelle is the only one who can get a nasty person like myself, all right, to come to church like this. What I'm saying to you, you can't just be watching Michelle. Then church becomes boring. You can't just come and watch Ammon, you know, inter- there's no entertainment in the church. Every one of us must play our part. 
Every one of us must discover our purpose within the body of Christ. You are not here by accident. There is no coincidence that you are here. You are here by divine appointment. And if you've never discovered this, I want you today, from today, to start beginning to think, I'm here by divine appointment. And it's just a matter of time to discover where you belong. The question is, where do you belong? Because Lent teaches us, we, 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 we can't just be saved. We need to save. We need to be committed to this body of Jesus Christ. And when we are committed to this body of Jesus Christ, we will commit our finances to this body of Jesus Christ. So that it's running well. We commit our time. We commit our resources. We commit our total human being. Remember what Paul is saying? Living sacrifices. There's no way you can just phone from home and say, well, well, no, no, no. God is not interested in the dead people or just no names. God is interested in living sacrifices. People can make time. Who can make the time? People can put in into the resources to make sure that the body of Jesus Christ is functioning. Why are you so quiet? Are you with me this morning? All right, I'm coming to an end. I'm, I'm, I'm landing the plane just now. Okay, let's, go, let's move on to the last one. So, so what Paul is saying here, in, in, in conclusion, Paul is saying that, you know, since we have come to know who we are, first of all, since we have come to know who God is, now we have identified that, you know, we have a new identity in Jesus Christ. Jesus has left his body called the church. We need to discover how to save in the body of Christ. Number one, he's saying we belong to one body. So the body is not full of confusion. The body is very much connected. We belong to this body. First Corinthians chapter 12. Hands, legs, eyes, all belong to one another. Some people are preachers in this church. Some people are administrators. Some people, you know, are very good at, you know, finance. Some people are very good, you know, at missions, you know, whatever. All these must be collected effort so that we begin to discover who is who, who is passionate with what. Elders must begin to say, well, you know, where do you belong? Where do you think you can be able to save? We should open up. Because, you know, the body of Jesus Christ is an open entity where each member can belong. Each member can belong. Each member can participate. Number two, he says, no, we need to save in this body. Service. The Lord Jesus Christ left us that. There is no boss in this. We are all the servants of the living God. Michelle is our leader. God has put her as a pastor in this congregation. But Michelle cannot do hundred things in this congregation. That's why we are there. To discover those hundred things. So that she becomes effective as a leader of this, of this congregation. We support one another. We support one another. Because there are those who are frail. There are those who need some care. There are those who really need some reach out. Just like the eye is one of the sensitive parts of the body. It needs some care. There are those who are eyes in the church who need a little bit of more care. They need some visitation. They need a phone call. They need a little bit of, you know, cheering up. We need to do that. And then he's saying, no, we need to use the gifts. Use the gifts. Each one of us have been given different gifts to contribute to the body of Jesus. The musicians, they are using the gifts here. Thank God. Those who are in missions must use their gifts. What is your gift? That's the question. What is your gift? Have you discovered your gift? If you haven't, I want you to begin to talk to Michelle or to the leaders of the church and say, look, I have discovered my my gift. I've been sitting, watching, and uh, Emon is saying, you know, it's time to be in the ground. It's time to start throwing. Okay, let me encourage the cricketers. It's time now to start throwing. All right, not just watching. It's time to start, you know, throwing. We, We need to seek opportunities to participate and save. Do not wait to be asked. Do not wait to be asked. What is wonderful about the church is that you will not be pushed into the game. It's your discovery. And you need to be comfortable. And if you're not comfortable, that's why you have people around you to encourage you and to cheer you as you move forward. There is no room for competition in this body. We complement each other. We complement each other's efforts and each other's gift. And that's what makes the body healthy. So what am I saying this morning, friends? I am saying... If there is a place that needs to be exciting, it's not the rugby place. It's not the soccer field. It's the church. Because in the church, the Lord has given a lot of gifts to each one of us. And we should make this place exciting. Exciting. This place should not be lacking in anything. Whether it's finance or resources or time or mission or children's ministry, whatever. You see, there are people who are busy with the children's ministry. So, 
<coughs> excuse me, I want to compliment those who have discovered their gifts, but I also want to encourage those like me who have been sitting on the periphery and watching the game. I am saying you have watched enough. It's time to jump in. No, no, no. I'm, I don't know where to start. Well, that's where there are people to talk to. We need to talk to people. We need to open up so that we become part of the body that is healthy and moving forward. This is my encouragement to you. Discover your purpose on earth. Don't become a passenger. We don't need passengers. We need you to drive also. Are you with me? God bless you. Thank you. Your tithes and offerings will now be received.